Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. This is the day our God has made. wrote, it matters what we believe. Some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days with fears of unknown calamities. 
Other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating the saved from the unsaved, friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Other beliefs are like gateways opening wide vistas for exploration. Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth of resourcefulness. Other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal worth. Some beliefs are rigid, like the body of death, impotent in a changing world. Other beliefs are pliable, like the young sapling ever growing with the upward thrust of life. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Let us dwell together in peace, and let us not be instruments of our own or other people's oppression. And now may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Well, we heard today that beliefs matter. That what we believe really does matter. A belief is a well-rehearsed opinion and can be changed. And if it isn't serving us well, maybe we should think about changing some of them. And I want to ask you, what is it that you believe about God? Now, I'm not asking you to recite a creed or a Bible verse, but just really check in and feel what it is that you believe. What is your attitude about God? What is your well-rehearsed opinion about God? What, when I say God, what is the thing that pops into your mind? When I was uh, 17, my favorite great aunt, who is, by the way, my great aunt Gladys' older sister Viola, it's true, my uh, favorite great aunt and my grandfather died five minutes apart. My grandfather died, and so we called to tell his sister-in-law, my grandmother's sister, that, uh, that my grandfather died, only to have her husband answer the phone and say that she had just died. And uh, I was very aggravated about that. I was very annoyed with, with God for that. Because my 17-year-old conception of God was is that God pulled the plug. That was God's job. God decided when all the people of the earth went home, you know, left the planet. What a terrible job. Like, you know, why would God even want that job? But in my 17-year-old thinking, that was God's job. God was the plug puller. And that God was so inconsiderate and so unkind that God couldn't space two of my favorite people out a couple of days apart. They had to be within the same five minutes. Oh, I was angry with God. And so, in church, I still would go to church to let God know how angry I was with God. I, you know, I wanted her to know. I'm just here to let you know I'm not talking to you. And when we would pray the Lord's Prayer, I would not pray Thy will be done because I did not trust the capricious will of such an unfeeling God. Of course I outgrew that. I, I, I got over that. I got a bigger God. I got a better God. I, I got a better relationship with God. I got a better experience of God, a better understanding of God. But in my decades of ministry now, I have discovered people who haven't progressed much farther than I was in those scary and sad days. So really, what is your concept of God? Because here's the thing. We think of ourselves as being made in God's image. And so we will never be better than our God. The image of God, that's what we are growing into. And so if the image we hold, this, this is why graven images are dangerous and, and the Bible warns against them, they're limiting. The, the image we hold is what we're growing into. Emerson said, be careful what you worship. Be sure you will worship something, so be careful what you worship because what you're worshiping, you are becoming. And so if God is a cruel God, we will never be less cruel than God. If God is an angry God, we will never be less angry than God. If God is a bigoted God, we will never be less of a bigot than God. We will never be better than our God. So what do we believe about God? It matters because what we believe about God is what we are choosing to be ourselves. And we will want to be better than some of our previous concepts of God. Jesus rocked the world by offering bigger and better 
ideas about God. Jesus referred to God as a loving parent. Now, that seems a little limiting to some of us who have been working on this for a while, but it was groundbreaking at the time. God, a, a, a loving presence, something that was always there, always cared, always did what it could for you, that was very different than the angry, punishing God some people had imagined. Or a lot of the gods were supposedly selfish and, and, and mischievous and mean. And this idea that there is, there is a nurturing mother, a protecting father, that th those are the qualities of God. That was new for a lot of people. It's still new for a lot of people. Jesus was saying that God is a loving presence. And a loving presence means that if we are part of that presence, we are meant to be the instruments of its power. We are the conduits through which that power flows. So if God is this loving mother, this loving father, this, this loving grandmother, this loving friend, if God is this loving presence moving through us, working through us, we are meant to be doing good things to change the world. We are meant to be healing the broken. We are meant to comfort the hurting. We are meant to challenge injustice. We are meant to work for peace. We are meant to topple empires because this loving presence working through us wants everyone safe and whole and cared for and needs met. Jesus believed in a good God. And because of that, he spent his life helping people, healing people, loving people, tearing down walls, lifting up people, giving people their dignity and their hope back. But domination, whether it takes the form of politics or religion, does not recognize or celebrate potential wholeness. Oppression deals in fracture. Oppression deals in wounds and deception. It is a broken religion and a broken society that will offer hate and call it love and look at love and call it demonic. But that's what's happening to Jesus today in the gospel reading. He is doing his, his God is love thing and love demands justice thing and justice changes the world thing and they said he's crazy, he might even be evil. Once you look at that kind of work and can't recognize it as good, Jesus will later say that is an unforgivable blasphemy because you've lost the plot entirely. Jesus believed in a good God. And Jesus believed in human potential. And Jesus believed that justice for all was the will of God. He called it the kingdom of God, in fact. Jesus believed that healing was possible. And his beliefs empowered people. And those who didn't want people empowered came down hard on Jesus. That shows how powerful his beliefs were. They tried to stamp them out. Because his beliefs matter. And so do ours. And his beliefs change the world. And so can ours. Let me share with you some of my beliefs today. I won't uh, give you 10 like the commandments. I, I won't give you 95 like Luther's theses. I'll keep it to seven. Seven, the number of sacraments, the number of the original deacons, the, uh, the, uh, gifts of, the number of the gifts of the Spirit enumerated by the prophet Isaiah. We'll keep it to seven, but really we could keep it to just one. I could combine the first two and say that God is omnipresent love. And that's my whole theology. That's the chicken I'm serving every week. Sometimes I serve it fricassee, sometimes I serve it roasted, sometimes I serve it barbecued, sometimes I serve it tetrazzini, but this is the chicken I serve every day of my life. God is omnipresent love. But that doesn't make for a long enough sermon. So I'm gonna break it down into seven. And so, the beliefs that I share, if you find them empowering, please adopt and if need be, adapt them. But I offer them for what they can be to you. And number one, I believe in the omnipresence of God. There's not a spot where God is not. I cannot, I'm part of God. God for God to be omnipresent means God is the only presence. Two things can't occupy the same place at the same time. There's no, there's no truth. There's no power in duality. And so for God to be omnipresent means God is the presence. And so that means that God isn't, and when we say that so many times, we think like God, when we say God is everywhere, it's like chicken man, bok, 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 he's everywhere, he's everywhere. But it's really just one little guy running lots of places, right? Or it's like, it's like Santa on every corner at Christmas. They're really not the same guy. And so we're thinking that God's here and here and here and here, or God's far away and just sees everywhere, but that's not omnipresence. 
Presence is the one presence. So if I'm here and you're there, but there's only one presence, that means we are part of the one presence. That means we cannot be, we are part and parcel of God, as Emerson said. We are, it is in God that we live and move and have our being, as Paul said. We can't be separate from God because God is the presence. And so, one with God, forever part of God, filled with God. I cannot be separate from God. And if it's true for me, it's true for you. Because that's the measure of truth, is that it's always true. It's everywhere true. So if it's true for me, it has to be true for you. If it was true for Jesus, it has to be true for me. And it has to be true for you. And if it's true for us, it has to be true for the people we like the most. And if it's true for them, it has to be true for the people we like the least. I struggle with it too. Don't be mad. I struggle with it too. But it's true that just because I'm not there yet doesn't mean I'm not growing in that direction because I've got a good God and I'm growing in the direction of my good God. I am becoming more of what I really already am and so are you. That's the spiritual journey. And so God is omnipresent. There's not a spot where God is not. But what is this omnipresent God? It's love. That's the second thing I believe, that God is omnipresent love. Not merely loving, not merely kind or generous or forgiving or understanding, but God is love itself. When you are loving, you are Godding. Love is the power, the presence that God is. And God's love, the love that God is, must be perfect. That's what God is, right? God is perfect. So God is not only everywhere present love, but it's perfect love. And perfect love rejects no one. Where would it reject it to when there's no other place? Because God is the omnipresence. So perfect love is all-inclusive, unconditional, and everlasting. It must embrace every life. Now some people, even still, even in the 21st century, some people will preach wrath and judgment and condemnation and damnation, but none of that can be true in the presence of omnipresent love. Number three, I believe that all people have sacred value. God is omnipresent. That means I'm part of God. If I'm part of God, I have sacred value, duh. Number four, I believe in miracles. A miracle is a change of perception from fear to love. When I came out, that was a miracle. The miracle is I thought anyone thought I was in. That was the first miracle. <laughs> but the second miracle was once you confront your fears, once you face your fears, once you turn from the fear and embrace the power of love in its place, that is a miracle. Other blessings may follow. Other changes may seem to occur, but the miracle is fear is defeated and love wins. That's resurrection. That is the parousia, the, the, the second coming. That is the victory at the end of, of, of good over evil. All of the myths, all of the stories, it is fear loses, love wins. And so when we turn from fear to love, we have experienced a miracle. Once we know God as an all-loving presence that we are always part of, that is our miracle. That is our liberation. That is our healing. That is our salvation. That is our justification. That is our at one moment atonement. That is whatever religious word we want to apply to it. It is the miracle whereby we are set free because God is love and God is good and God is all there is. And every moment we remember that is a miracle moment because that is the moment that we are free. That is the moment that we realize we are God's miracle and not God's mistake. Number five, I believe that we are meant to be blessed. Not just that we get lucky sometimes or that we can earn some favor now and again, but that we are meant to be blessed. Emma Curtis Hopkins said, there is good for me and I ought to have it. It's mine, I deserve it. Can't keep it from me. There is good for me and I ought to have it. Jesus prayed, give us this day our daily bread. Give all of us right now what we need. Give us this day our daily bread. John prayed, may you prosper and be in good health. Isaiah heard God saying, like a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. Moses led people through a wilderness where they found manna and quail and where even toxic water was made fresh. Flint, Michigan needs a Moses, don't they? 
We say here all the time when we're facing medical problems or difficulties, say a prayer and take a pill. If one doesn't work, the other will. Do it all. Why do you go to the doctor? Why do you apply for a job? Why do you apply for your pension? Why do you try to get insurance? Why, why do you apply for aid when, when you're down and out? Why do, you, why do we do anything to make life better? Because we know there is good for us and we ought to have it. And so we pray thy will be done. And it is God's will for us to be blessed and to share our blessings. And number six, I believe that injustice is sin. Now, I don't use the word sin a lot because it has been used in sinful ways to hurt, control, and terrorize people. But sin is missing the mark. And injustice is missing the mark. We are meant to live in right relationship. We are meant to care for each other. We are meant to be our brother's and sister's keeper. We are meant to have compassion for those who are hurting. We are meant, when we are doing well, to, to help out those who are doing less well. We are meant to be compassion and hope and joy in action in the world. And so when we deny that, not only when we forget to do it, but when we actually deny it, that is injustice. That is missing the mark. That is not the God love principle, right? And so cruelty is missing the mark. Oppression is missing the mark. Avarice is missing the mark. Spreading hate and fear is missing the mark. And doing it in the name of Jesus is just a damn lie. Injustice denies the love that God is and the love that God calls us to share. It is unjust, unloving, and sinful to vilify transgender people. It is unjust, unloving, and sinful to torment, bully, and exclude same gender loving people. It is unjust, unloving, and sinful to tell people who have lost a loved one to a tragedy, even a seemingly self-imposed tragedy, to tell them that their loved one is anywhere other than in the arms of God. There's no other place to be. There's not a spot where God is not. It is unjust. It is unjust, unloving, and sinful to harden our hearts toward the poor, the sick, the asylum seeker, or the refugee. Injustice is sin. And number seven, I believe that since injustice is sin, our sacred mission is to correct injustice. The prophet Micah said this is what God requires of us only, to do justice and love mercy and live humbly. Justice and mercy. Fairness and compassion, what else would omnipresent love ask of us? Justice work is the call of the gospel. Jesus was not on a suicide mission. He didn't shuttle down from heaven just to die so that I could get a shot at heaven. That whole story is ridiculous. It does not paint God in a very good light. No, Jesus came expressing God love, and God love is justice love, and injustice tried to shut him up by killing him, but injustice forgets. Injustice doesn't know anything about resurrection. God love death can't be killed. Justice love can't stay dead. The hope that justice love inspires will always rise again and again, and so, yes, Jesus came sharing God love, justice love. Injustice tried to shut him up and injustice failed because that's the power of resurrection. It's how the kingdom of God will be established on earth. It is what the church is supposed to be, sharers of God love, which is justice love. I believe that justice and mercy are the guiding principles for followers of Jesus. I believe that God is omnipresent and what that omnipresence is, is love. Therefore, I believe that all people have sacred value, that miracles are possible, and that we are meant to be blessed. And I believe that injustice is sin, and that we are called to correct injustice with the ministry of justice and mercy. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the mission of his church as I understand it today. Will you support this mission faithfully and enthusiastically? If so, then this is the good news. Amen. No.
Friends, as we prepare to share in this sacred meal, I am mindful 
that each person, all of those gathered here, and all people throughout the world are created in the divine image. I know that there are people who have been set aside, bullied, who have felt the sting of discrimination. I know that women, people of color, those who do not identify as Christian, those in the LGBTQ community are often targets of prejudice, of hatred, and of violence. And I know that as followers of Jesus, we must affirm the lives and the sacred value of those who are most vulnerable in this world. So I am very mindful of something, a judgment that happened this past week. My friends, I know, I believe that setting aside any religious dogma, Jesus would have baked that wedding cake. And not only that, Jesus would have decorated the cake and Jesus would have danced joyfully at the wedding. Yes. Because Jesus' message continues to be that we are to love all, we are to serve all. That is true hospitality. That is the open table. And that is living out the message that Jesus shared with us. And so as we prepare to share in this meal, we remember that on the last night of his life, Jesus had gathered with his friends with his family, with his family of choice for a Passover meal. And during that meal, Jesus took a piece of leftover bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he offered it to all of them saying, take and eat of this bread. And know that when you are hurting, when you feel broken yourself, when you have been targeted because of who you are, you can eat of this bread and remember me. And at the end of the supper, Jesus took a cup from the table. He told those gathered, this cup represents my love poured out for each of you. When you drink from this cup, drink deeply. Let its message of compassion and of welcome fill you and remember me. My friends here at the Sunshine Cathedral, we practice an open communion. What that means is that you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to receive the sacrament. Just as you are, with whatever your beliefs or doubts may be, you are welcome to participate in this feast of unconditional love. And as Reverend Ann said, Jesus would have baked, would have iced, and I believe Jesus would have served the cake. So in symbolic measure, we today will be offering both the communion wafer and symbolically representing the cake, graham crackers. You have a choice of receiving the host or the graham crackers. It is your choice, but know that Jesus is serving the cake. These are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God.